Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the very best NCLEX review in the country, in my opinion. So let's go ahead and uh, keep going. This is our Pharmacology 4 video. So we've done three previously. I recommend going back and watching those if you haven't, although you don't have to watch them in any particular order. All right, let's go ahead. Oh, that's kind of small. Let's go ahead and look at these. And I'm going to make this a little bit um, different here. Okay. You're caring for a client admitted with AFib RVR, which is rapid ventricular response. They are on a continuous cardism IV drip. The technician shows you the following rhythm. Okay. So you have orders for all the following, which is your priority intervention. So here we have AFib RVR. And cardizem, if you don't know, cardizem is the drug of choice uh, primarily for AFib, especially with RVR because it slows down the heart rate and can even convert them back into sinus rhythm. So when you hang them, put them on a cardizem drip, you're really watching to see if they're converting back into sinus rhythm. And then once the cardizem, it, it, it usually runs for like 24 hours, something like that. I mean, not be quite that long. And then they put them take them back over and put them on PO cardizem. Okay. So when you look at this, the question is, what is this? Is this still a fib? Is this something else? So what we have here is if you look at it, it is irregular. Now, if you watch the previous video, or if you've watched any of our EKG videos, if you haven't go back and watch them, because you'll understand this better. Having said that, this rhythm is irregular. The most common irregular rhythm is AFib. Now, how do I know for sure that it's AFib? Well, do you see how there's no distinct P wave? There's just a bunch of squiggles along that baseline. There's no distinct P wave. So when there's no distinct P wave, but there is a narrow QRS and it's irregular, this is AFib. So we're still in AFib, but we're not rapid ventricular response anymore. So it's really slowed down, right? So I don't think, I don't know if this is a six second strip. I don't know that it is, but even if it isn't a six second strip, I still know this is slower. This, this heart rate is definitely not your normal rate. Okay. So having said that, um, I say, well, it's really slowed it down. There's still an AFib. So you have orders for all the following, which is your priority intervention. So I can do any of these, right? So I've got orders say to titrate it up or down or to stop it and so forth. Okay. So what do I want to do? So I'm still in AFib, but I've really slowed it down. So do I want to titrate, try titrate the cardizem drip up, which is going to slow it down more? Do I want to titrate the cardizem drip down? which will speed it up a little bit. Do I want to administer atropine, which is for symptomatic bradycardia, or do I want to turn off the cardizem and start amiodarone? So amiodarone is for ventricular dysrhythmia, so I'm crossing off number four. I'm also going to cross off number one because I don't want to titrate the cardizem drip up because that'll just slow the heart rate down more. So the question is, do I want to titrate the cardizem drip down or do I need to give atropine? Well, we don't give atropine. <laughs> Uh, I'm, it's for, we don't give atropine when the reason they're slow is because of the cardizem. So we're not going to do that. So we're going to titrate the cardizem drip down. That is the correct answer. You're discharging a patient with a new prescription for furosemide, which is the following. Would you teach him before he is discharged? Select all that apply. All right. Furosemide. If you watched our pharmacology one video, then you know this is a potassium wasting diuretic, potassium wasting. So knowing that, I keep that in mind. Now, I want to I want to look for the true statements because I'm not looking what needs further teaching. I'm like, what would I teach him before he's discharged? So if I if I turn every one of these into a true false statement, I'm going to pick the true statements. If you struggle with SATA questions, go watch our SATA videos. All right, number one, take this medication in the evening before going to bed. Well, this is a diuretic, so I'm going to say that's false because then they'll just be up all night going to the bathroom. Number two, report to the healthcare provider if you experience increased fatigue or weight gain. Well, I don't expect them to have increased fatigue or weight gain, so definitely report that if they have it because I'm like, that's not expected. So yeah, definitely, we're going to true. They do want to report that. Number three, the healthcare provider may prescribe a potassium supplement for you. Well, this is a potassium 
wasting diuretic. It doesn't say they will prescribe a potassium supplement. It says they may prescribe a potassium supplement. I like the word may. And since it's potassium wasting, I'm going to pick three. That's a true statement. You will need to have your blood drawn every week until the level of furosemide is stabilized in your body. We don't check furosemide levels, so that's false. You will be able to stop taking the furosemide once the swelling in your ankles has improved. Well, that's not typically how furosemide is ordered. Typically, it's ordered because of an underlying disease. It doesn't tell us they have an underlying disease, but it doesn't tell us that they're taking it just because they have swelling in their ankles either. So I'm not picking five. That's not typically how we do that. So the correct answers are to report to the healthcare provider if you experience increased fatigue or weight gain, and the healthcare provider may prescribe a potassium supplement for you. So those are the correct answers. Okay. So remember, furosemide is a potassium wasting diuretic. All right, match the drug with its common side effects. So one of the things a lot of times test takers stress over is how many side effects do I need to know? Well, here's, uh, these are common side effects that I would recommend you knowing. So DIG, I think everybody knows what digoxin is. It's an inotropic agent, means it strengthens the heart. Fentanyl is for pain. Um, lithium, we talked about that in the last video, or maybe the second video. I don't, I think it might've been the second video. Lithium is an electrolyte that's used to treat bipolar. Vancomycin is a, an antibiotic for severe infections. Methylprednisolone is a steroid. Adenosine, adenosine is used to treat supraventricular tachycardia. It slows the heart rate down. Sertraline is an antidepressant and albuterol is a bronchodilator. If you don't know those things, you need to know what I just said. So rewind this video and listen to what I said about each med and write it down. If you're taking notes, write it down. If you like typed up the list of meds, remember the, the list of 50 meds that's in the in the comments, not the comment section, but you know, the, the description of the video section, those are the 50 meds you need to know. So um, if we're cut, if th you find those 50 meds on that list and you write down the things I just said. All right. So let's talk about this. So tachycardia, what is a common side effect, common side effect, not adverse effect. So out of all these drugs, we know for sure that albuterol can cause tachycardia, right? All right. How about bradycardia? Well, we've got two options, really. Um, I look at I look at digoxin and I look at fentanyl. Now you might say, well, what about adenosine? Well, we're not going to pick adenosine because um, bradycardia is not actually the common side effect. Asystole is actually the common side effect of adenosine. And by the way, that is generalist knowledge. Every nurse knows that adenosine causes asystole, a short few seconds of asystole before it, it turns, goes back to sinus rhythm. Anyway, so we've got digoxin and fentanyl. Well, which is more likely very, very common to cause bradycardia. Well, it's the digoxin, okay? Digoxin is an inotropic agent, but it also slows conduction through the AV node and it definitely slows heart rate. Red man syndrome. Red man syndrome is actually vancomycin. It's a side effect. Um, as far, I, I've never actually seen it happen, but I guess it can cause some flushing in the face and all you have to do is slow down the vancomycin. So that's some facial flushing um, that can occur with vancomycin. You don't have to stop it. You can just turn it down. And then hyperglycemia. I hope everybody knows steroids can cause hyperglycemia. It's a side effect. We don't necessarily have to stop the med for it, but we do have to monitor it. And then paresthesia. Paresthesia is the symptom that incurs with all electrolyte imbalances all electrolyte imbalances result in paresthesia. And if the electrolyte imbalance doesn't even have to be that severe for paresthesia to occur. So which of these drugs is actually an electrolyte? Well, it's lithium. Okay. So paresthesia is commonly associated with lithium. Um, now drowsiness. So we've got left, what do we have? Fentanyl. Well, that's a pain med, narcotic. So Definitely could happen with that. Adenosine, well, that's for SVT, probably not. Um, sertraline, that's an antidepressant, so probably not. So we're going to go with the fentanyl. Um, and the reason I picked fentanyl for drowsiness over the bradycardia is because bradycardia is common with digoxin, whereas drowsiness is common with fentanyl, okay? And then xerostomia, if you don't know this word, you have to know what the word means, and it means dry mouth. 
Dry mouth, y'all, is the most common side effect of any psych drug, any psych drug, except lithium, because lithium is an electrolyte. Um, so I'm talking about psych drugs like tranquilizers and antidepressants. That's what I mean by psych drugs, tranquilizers and antidepressants. Dry mouth is the most common symptom. So definitely with sertraline and then asystole, adenosine. If you don't know this, adenosine is given rapid, rapid, rapid IV push. And it causes asystole followed then by hopefully the sinus node picking back up and getting back into a sinus rhythm. So if you don't know these things, stop it, rewind it, or listen to this particular video several times. Well, working on your med search floor, you have a patient who's been seizing for eight minutes. That is called status epilepticus, if you don't know what that means. So long, long seizing, status epilepticus is when someone's been seizing and don't seem to be coming out of it. Which of the following medications would you administer? Lorazepam orally, phenytoin rectally, lorazepam IV or phenytoin IV. So they are seizing. So we're not going to give anything orally. So we're going to cross off the lorazepam orally. Now, the interesting thing is phenytoin is used to prevent seizures, but not to treat seizures. We don't give phenytoin when someone is seizing. So what we do is we give benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are the drug of choice for status epilepticus. If you don't know it, write it down. Keep track of it. You need to know that. Benzodiazepines, the PAMLAMs, PAM, this ends in PAM, lorazepam. So lorazepam orally, it's the right drug, but it's the wrong route. Phenytoin is the wrong med. Lorazepam IV is the right med and the right route. Phenytoin IV is the wrong med. So we use it, we, again, we use those to prevent the phenytoin we use to prevent seizures, not treat them. All right, one more. Which of the following lab values indicates a toxic level of the drug? Now you don't have to know all toxic levels, but you do have to know these four. These are the four toxicity levels that you've got to know. So here they are. If you don't know them, write it down. Lithium. Toxic is over two. So that's the toxic level. Phenytoin. Toxic is over 20. Digoxin. Toxic is over two. And aminophilin. Toxic is over 20. So lithium is the toxic level here. All right, Clinic Reviews is working hard to um, uh, update our reviews for next gen. So just be aware that if you take a review with us, it will be updated. I will give you the specific dates for updates um, in another video as soon as Mark tells me that. And so you can know that and go to clinicreviews.com to see when our upcoming reviews are. We've got some exciting things coming out, some changes coming to Clinic Reviews with next gen. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.